Let's bring in uh, John Calamos. Uh, John, what's your take on the level and pace of selling that we have seen in this past week? Does it provide amazing buying opportunities if you have a very long time investment horizon like you have? Well, I do have a long time investment horizon. I think trying to time this is going to be uh, very, very difficult. Uh, it does seem to be an overreaction. Uh, uh, if, if this is so bad, why, why did the Chinese market go up? So it's, it seems to me uh, a bit of an overreaction, and uh, I, I would just tell investors not to panic out of it. Uh, you know, I, I think uh, the economy is still in, in good shape. Obviously, uh, this is going to change a lot of things, and we have to be selective about how we invest going forward in here. Uh, but uh, I think it's a bit more of a panic. So, John, just, just to play devil's advocate, two points on why the Chinese market may not be going up. Number one, people wonder if you can trust that, right, the state-controlled economy, state-controlled maybe stock market buying. And, and number two, they put in place draconian quarantines, which is helping, appearing to help the, the situation, something that we cannot do in this country. Yeah. Well, that's true. I am not uh, trying to uh, defend that. But I do see that uh, in this day and age, uh, we do have a lot of uh, scientific and uh, biotech uh, materials that will resolve this issue. So uh, I would not be selling into this thinking that this is going to drive the economy into a recession. We don't see that. I think uh, there will be uh, different uh, opportunities in here, different investment themes that w we should be watching in here. Uh, you know, and uh, some, of, uh, some of the strategies we utilize in our uh, liquid alternative strategies, we built in some downside protection in there. So I think that's all uh, makes sense in here. Mike, just wanted to ask what you make of uh, where the volatility index closed and, and what that's telling us as well about whether we can possibly know if we're going to find a bottom soon. I mean, on one level, it just simply reflects how wild and dramatic the move has been in a short period of time, but it shows unabating demand for downside hedges. The structure of all these kind of volatility products are upside down right now. We're right now in the near term. There's huge demand for short-term protection, not as much out uh, a ways. And it doesn't, it shows you that it's still a bit of a treacherous market. And as I said before, it feels as if there was a forced aspect to this final late uh, kind of whoosh lower, uh, which sometimes just means that people are either sort of trapped or being forced to sell or unwinding these strategies that are, that are uh, completely off sides. Now, that's sometimes what you want. You want kind of something indiscriminate to at least say that um, the tactical players are going to feel like the risk reward looks better the next day. But we're not getting to a point where it's all of a sudden calm enough. We can figure out fundamental value. By the way, the regular money managers are having outflows right now. The indexes have big outflows in the last couple of days. So that's the, the vicious cycle that you get into sometimes before you have a low. So, Stephanie, all the industry groups are lower for the S&P for the week so far. But the ones that have outperformed with 9% with moves lower, consumer staples, utilities, and healthcare not looking nearly as bad as energy, technology, and materials. So how would you recommend portfolio managers and investors look to get more defensive in this market? Well, I think you want a barbell. I don't think you want all on one group of defensives or all one group of cyclicals. Look, if we bounce uh, in the coming days, the defensives are going to underperform, right? The cyclicals will probably rally along with technology, although I, I would sell some of the technology names into that. At the end of the day, I think what's going on here, obviously, is we're trying to figure out where are we, where, what are we modeling? We can't model anything. We can't model economic growth. We can't model earnings. So what do you do? And if, if you go back to Mike's chart, where if you have zero earnings growth, the market is trading at 18.4 times forward. That is expensive for zero growth. Now, last year, we didn't have earnings growth, but we had multiple expansion because we came from such a low level at 14 times, and we actually saw multiple expansion throughout the year as we got through some uncertainties. Now, you don't have the earnings growth and you have a high multiple, so I can totally understand what's happening here. Let's put it into context, though. The S&P is only down 7% year-to-date, even though it's down a lot from its highs. The NASDAQ is down 4.5% year-to-date, only though it is down a lot from its highs. So it feels really bad, but we have to get more certainty and understanding about what we're going to 
do be doing with earnings for it to get really aggressive. But I would barbell in the meantime, and I would stick to my strategy of quality, upgrading your portfolio. I'm able to bring in now Mohamed El Arian to join this uh, markets panel that we've got going at the moment. And Mohamed, uh, you, you said uh, correctly when we saw the, the first little rally uh, after the first coronavirus-related pullback that, that people shouldn't buy that dip. What, why did you say that then? And uh, now we've had a second dip, a massive dip. Do you start to think that uh, we, we've overrun to the downside? Thanks for having me. So first I said it because people were underestimating what I call the economic sudden stop. What happens when everything comes to a stop in certain parts of the world? There is massive con economic contagion that goes on. But people simply didn't understand that this is a dynamic in play and that things would get a lot worse before we, tur we turn a corner. Now we have phase two of this, which is not just an economic disruption, but a financial dislocation. And that will feed onto itself for a while. So as much as there's value in certain names, because these sell-offs become very indiscriminate, as we saw today, it's not yet safe, in my opinion, to get back into the market as a whole. You've got to let these economic financial dynamics play out a little bit before the market is attractive enough for the sort of risk that's ahead. Would you be advising people get out of the market? Well, it depends where, where the initial conditions are. Um, you know, I advised that a long time ago um, to be careful. Um, I wouldn't get out of names that have three characteristics. One is very big balance sheets. You need a lot of cash and very little debt to navigate what's ahead because markets will start freezing up, even if the Fed cuts rates, which I think it will. Two is you, may, you want to make sure that you are relatively isolated from trading elements because the movement of goods and services is going to be hit even harder. And three, you just need management that realizes that there's going to be opportunities because there's going to be a ton of opportunities for the stronger companies. Uh going to have to just apologize to our viewers who can see this. For some reason, New York Stock Exchange is allowing a musical performance here on the floor after a day of a massive sell-off. We'll try and allow our microphone still to be heard during this. John Calamos, uh, a question to, to you. Uh, uh, John Calamos, a question to you in terms of those strong balance sheets that Mohammed referred to, strong cash flows. Are there companies or sectors in the U.S. market that stand out to you that are safe and protected in that regard? Yeah, I think he's uh, correct there. Uh, you know, we, we do focus on uh, individual companies, and obviously in the U.S. it's going to be uh, very positive. Uh, so uh, I, w w I would Good agree plan. with that. But uh, the— uh, you know, strong balance sheets are good, and uh, the the bond surrogate trade is going to be there as well uh, with these very low interest rates. So you'll you'll look for uh, stocks with uh, good dividends and things like that. So, so, John, just help us understand any stimulative effect, if any, that could be that could come out of these low interest rates. Stephanie was saying she was shopping for housing stocks, for instance. How do you look at it? The well, it looks like uh, the the consumer is still strong uh, here in the U.S. and and with the uh, mortgage rates coming down and the uh, housing, uh, so we'll we'll see some positive uh, factors uh, play into that as well. So it does seem like a, a good opportunity. John, in terms of uh, the, the yield picture that we've got at the moment. Uh, do you feel like equities can find a bottom uh, before yields find a bottom, or do we have to see yields bottom first? Yeah, I, I think the, the low, uh, the very low interest rate environment, as you know, this is the lowest interest rate environment we've ever seen. Uh, so it's going to be uh, difficult. So obviously uh, looking at... Uh, uh, part of the equity markets, uh, good dividends and things like that are, are important. So I, I think that plays into uh, this market. Uh, it seems like this is a bit of a panic in the market. It kind of reminds me of 1987 uh, crash. And uh, 
So it, it's not something that I would be selling out of uh, in this market. So I, I, would, I, I would think uh, there would be some opportunities going forward in here.